what are world models and how can a model learn inside its own dream environment? Yeah, I love this. I love this topic. This is so fascinating to me. And it's actually the reason I started writing the book in the first place was a paper in uh, 2018 by David Haar, Jürgen Schmidt-Huber, called, just simply called World Models. And it's effectively, a, it's like a collision between two of my favorite fields, which are generative AI and reinforcement learning. Um, and in the paper, they describe how you can build a agent. Uh, an agent is in reinforcement learning, something that takes actions within the environment. Uh, and the agent has within it uh, the variational autoencoder that we've just talked about. Um, and what that's doing is it's trying to collapse down what it's seeing. In, in the example in the paper, it was a car racing in, around a track. It's trying to collapse that down into a latent space, which it can predict uh, chronologically. So it's now trying to model how its future looks given its latent understanding of what it's seeing and the action that it's just taken. And this is where everything collides for me because it's like you've got the VAE, the various auto encoder, creating the latent space of the environment and understanding what it's seeing. You've then got a, an auto regressive model. They used an RNN, recurrent neural network, in the paper, which tries to predict auto regressively how that latent space will evolve over time given its actions. And then you've got reinforcement learning, which is an entirely different field, which then says, how do you? How do you take actions that maximizes the reward given the environment that you're in is, in is in your own hallucination of how this latent space evolves? And the latent space, of course, includes how the reward evolves over time and what kind of um, episode reward you're going to get. So I, I love this field because a, a world model for me is every, it encapsulates everything about machine learning that we've learned so far. Um, there's discriminative stuff involved, but also a generative component, a reinforcement learning component. Um, and I think this is a really powerful concept uh, in teaching agents to behave as in an environment with their own sort of generative understanding of how that world operates. It feels very close to how we do it as humans. You know, when when we're learning a new topic, <clears throat> we're not it's not really something that we uh, expect the environment to give us a nice packaged up reward function for. Um, we seem to be able to have an inherent understanding of how the world operates and then layer on top our actions onto this understanding. Um, so if I'm shooting a, a basketball through, through the hoop, you know, I, I kind of know what's going to happen because I can imagine what the action is going to do to my latent interpretation of what I'm seeing. And so it makes me learn. I mean, I'm still terrible at it, but it, in theory <laughs> should make me learn a lot faster because I have um, I have an internal internal representation. I'm not just operating on the pixel space of my uh, my, my eyes. Yeah, so mo world models are the reason I wrote the book, really. Um, so I've got a lot to owe to them. Super cool. All right, so world models blend variational autoencoders, autoregression, deep reinforcement learning um, to allow machines to visualize, to imagine, to dream um, some time steps into the future. Um, as to like what the most likely outcomes are given a current state. Mm -hmm. And this allows it with the deep reinforcement learning component to then take actions that allow it to achieve some objective. And uh, just to break down a few of the terms that you use there from reinforcement learning, um, you talked about a reward function. So, mm -hmm. um, and, and you also talked about agents. So in a reinforcement learning pr paradigm, so reinforcement learning has been around for decades and Reinforcement learning is a is a is a class of machine learning problem, really, where you want um, an agent you, that could be a person or it could be a machine um, to be able to take a series of actions. So, a, a really big example of deep reinforcement learning in, in recent years is the AlphaGo algorithm by Google mm -hmm. DeepMind, which was able to beat the world's best Go player. So, this kind of thing where you have a board game where there's a sequence of actions and you want the agent to be able to um, to predict what likely actions are going to lead to winning the game of Go or winning a video game. Um, could be an Atari video game was very popular a few years ago for training these deep reinforcement learning algorithms. And oh yeah, I should say that a reinforcement learning algorithm is a deep reinforcement learning algorithm when we use deep learning to solve the reinforcement learning problem. Um, exactly. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I think that ties together all the terms. Oh, a reward was the last one there. Where, so 
in reinforcement learning, we let's say we have it playing a video game, then we provide it with the pixels on the screen. And that's like the state of play. But in addition to that, we have a reward function, which in video games is often really easy, which is why Atari video games were so popular a choice for um, tackling with deep reinforcement learning problems because they have an inbuilt score, like Atari games, like all of them have a point score that we're trying to maximize. And so we feed that reward to the algorithm and it learns, okay, if I take this action, if I press right on the joystick or left on the joystick, is that likely to increase my reward in the future or decrease it or keep it flat? And so uh, reinforcement learning algorithms are trying to maximize their reward. And so your point there was with most uh, reinforcement learning approaches, in fact, as far as I was aware until this conversation, all reinforcement learning approaches, we had to have this Re, this reward function um, made explicit that the mm -hmm. algorithm is trying to maximize. So if we go outside of the uh, video game scenario, once we're, say, teaching an algorithm to uh, drive a car, we'd have to come up with, we'd have to manufacture some function. Like you, uh, you get one extra point for every meter traveled. Exactly. Um, mm -hmm towards a destination, but you lose a thousand points if you hit a pedestrian. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, and so what you were just saying now is fascinating to me because I think you said that with these world models, we can have a deep reinforcement learning model learning real world problems without needing to specify explicitly what that reward function is. Yeah, it, it's a it's a case of the world model itself doesn't need the uh, reward function. The the world model is simply trying to understand how its actions can um, be used to effectively model and um, uh, predict how the environment will move in future. Then the power of it is that you can layer on top of that a particular task, and of course that task would have to have a reward function. But obviously, th this is a lot faster than just from scratch learning a reinforcement learning task from scratch with a reward function. It's almost like the world model gets you 80% of the way there because you have an un inherent understanding of the physics of your environment before you say to it, now try and drive the car fast. Um, so in, in the paper, for example, what they do is they, they actually just train the world model completely task independently. So there's no reward. They just say, take some actions, observe what happens. So drive the car forward, drive the car left, drive the car right, brake, and just see how what your observation does. Like, don't worry about going fast. Just drive and see what happens, like randomly. Which just feels like what a baby does when it's you know, crawling around on the floor. And my eight-month-year-old is is doing this, uh, hopefully, more and more every day, um, until the point where we wanted to definitely not do this. 